started out in pediatrics a few years ago, we all knew that breastfeeding was best for mothers and for children. And it's astonishing that we still find ourselves in debate and argument within the medical community and certainly with the industry. So I think it's particularly pertinent that we have invited the advocacy group to come and speak about a lot of the issues related to infant feeding, some of the ethical challenges, some of the practical challenges, and some of the legal issues around it. So I'm going to hand over to Chris to introduce the advocacy group. Thanks everyone. It's a great pleasure to be able to, uh, to run this uh, advocacy symposium. As you heard, we're going to focus on issues related to the marketing of breast milk substitutes. This is a, a very important area for us and uh, our experience with uh, the industry in terms of regulating the way we control their advertising at our own sponsored events is, is, is what brought this to a head. And we thought we'd start off this morning by, by asking Professor Mark Blockman from, from uh, who's the head of the ethics committee at UCT uh, to give us a talk on the ethics of industry influences and the conflicts of interest as it relates to to, to breast milk, uh, to, to, to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and uh, Professor Rockman is, uh, is a global and a national and global expert on drug policy and uh, drug uh, uh, and, and, and its uh, and national formularies and, and, and the like. And has a deep understanding of how the industry regulates drugs how the industry uh, interacts with the medical fraternity in terms of um, influencing our, our, our choices. So it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome him to talk to us. We asked him a very short notice and I'm very glad that he's been able to get that. Thank you very much. Good morning everybody and thank you very much for inviting me. So um, the decision basically is if you give me enough money I'll just go to tell you which one was the Breast or, 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 or no breast. So, um, so my idea basically is to have a little look at, at the industry influences, how we look at EBM and the conflict of interest. And as you'll see, I've got lots of conflicts of interest and for a small fee, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> so this is the CAGE questionnaire, and it has it ever prescribed Celebrex, which is an also anti-inflammatory? Do you get annoyed by uh, people who complain about drug lunches and free gifts? Is there any medication logo on your uh, pen or that you're using at this moment in time? And I'm sure you're all going to be finding one. And, uh, and you drink your eye opener from a lippy tour and you put any drug company name into that. <laughs> if you answered yes to any two of them all that love, you're probably uh, drug company dependent. <laughs> so so this, is, this, is, this is the biggest problem for us in terms of my fees are quite high and yet you say you have a little money, I think I'm seeing a conflict of interest here. <laughs> and, and this is the erosion of the, of the, of the, of, of the public trust. So, Whenever we talk about it over here, and for me, the biggest issue is that I'm a Mr. and Mrs. Public. And uh, we hold a very kind of accountable process, and if we erode the trust of the, of, the, of the public, it's a disaster for them, because medicine's confusing. It's not like blind red, we can squeeze it and make a decision if it's uh, good or bad. Uh, you've got to trust in somebody prescribing, trust in the regulator, and trust that it may or may not do what, uh, what the purpose is. And that you hope that the pe person prescribing that, that hasn't, that hasn't got any undue influence. So this is all of us, and stand up if anybody disagrees. I've never been bought, I cannot be bought, I'm an icon and I have a reputation for honesty and integrity, and let the chips fall where they may. It is true that there are people in my situation who could not receive a million dollar grant and stay objective, but I do. So, when you're in your bath tonight, which you know that I have, okay? <laughs> well, I'm just seeing how many people are bathing, okay? Take, take a look. Um, all of us, all of us have a number. I'm not going to ask you what that number is. There's a number that all of us have that will persuade us to change what we do. Don't tell me what that is, but think about that. Everybody has this number which somebody may offer them to change what, uh, what, uh, what they may decide to do and what they may prescribe in our situation. That stuff doesn't influence me at all. I don't even know what the place is. I'm not pet. I just go for the food. That's the majority, that's the, that's the, that's the majority of it. That's the, that's the reason I came here. Yeah, I thought I was going to get, I bought a bag. I thought I was going to get presents and, and money. I'm getting nothing. So just to talk a little bit about the, the industry, the pharmaceutical industry. So what is the, what is the goal? If you think the pharmaceutical industry is altruistic, you're wrong. Okay? 
Okay? There's, there's no reason to believe that. They're, they're not in the industry to look after patients at all. Their idea is to look after financial, uh, financial issues, their boards, and to make sure that they have a big profit margin for, uh, for the stock exchange that they're on. Okay? Our mission is to research, teach, and serve the public, and I can serve the public down there. And when pharma pays the researcher, which is not uncommon, there's a distinction blurred between uh, what our actual mission is as, uh, as, as physician scientists or as clinician like academics. And when you link the two together, it raises a conflict of interest. So I'm not going to talk today truly about defining conflict, conflict of interest because that wasn't, wasn't my brief, but it's worthwhile reading a little bit about what, what, what it is to have a conflict of interest uh, and, and how naughty it really is because I actually do not believe a conflict of interest is naughty. We all conflict in, in terms of what we're doing. It's how we mitigate that risk which is very important, how we stop, stop the perceptions of, uh, of, 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 the, of the conflict of interest. And sometimes we have to recuse ourselves completely, or we can just uh, volunteer that we have a conflict and we can actually, we can actually move on. However, okay, in terms of looking at a systematic review about conflicts of interest, okay, the limited data is describing, don't worry, only I can read this, describing the high levels of conflict of interest among, uh, amongst people like ourselves who give opinions okay, or look after patients. Okay? Because it's, it's not usual for people to discuss, despite the fact that journals want it, it's not usual to fully discuss because nobody really follows it up. Okay? However, you can go and Mr. Dr. Google, you can find out about, about absolutely everybody. Okay? So there's nothing to hide. You can dig deep into people and you can actually find their conflicts, where they worked, okay? why they're writing these articles, why they're reviewers, etc., etc. And you get an understanding of why they're linked to either a particular company or a particular topic and where they may have come from. And you can actually find massive conflicts of interest in the authors that we have and the reasons why they are, are writing these papers, uh, especially for the, for the companies. Which brings me on to the, the issue of what's called key opinion leaders. Anybody a key opinion leader in here? Don't tell me. Okay. So key opinion leaders, you can go to the key opinion leader site and you can rent a key opinion leader. And what the industry does is that they pay um, academic people or people in very high levels um, a lot of money to travel all over the world. And the reason why they do that is because they believe that we can't read. Don't you think it's quite interesting that you need somebody from all over the world to come at a big meeting to describe and to tell you about a clinical trial and the outcomes? Yes, you may tell me that they're temperate with their, with their clinical experience, but that means we don't have the clinical experience. So it's interesting that we've got to go and listen to somebody else tell us the wonderful news about a clinical trial, okay? especially when it's unpublished and unpeer-reviewed. That's what, that's what they do. So that's very important. It happens at conferences, where it's the first, you know, first, first comes out, and then only later does the peer review article comes out, where we actually get a true understanding of what the effect size is, what the adverse events are, and truly, if there's good data, it suggests that what they're saying is what we actually be doing. But you can read a key opinion leader, and if you pay me enough, I'll change my opinion on breastfeeding as we, as we, as we go on. This is very important. This is a very problem. And this is the issue around ghostwriting. Because what you need and what, uh, what, what you require is, is, to, is to have a drumbeat. You have to have a, a whole um, strategic plan around something that you want to advocate for. So if you believe that the industry, um, for example, just have a couple of randomized control studies to look after the regulatory environment, to get something registered or to be marketed, that's not true. They have a whole strategic plan looking at how they're going to get us to prescribe their drug. They will tell you how many RCTs, how many phase two studies they're going to have, how many review articles, how many narrative reviews, how many systematic reviews, how many people are going to do CPDs. There's our whole strategic plan of how we're going to get this information out to, uh, to us to, uh, to, uh, to decide if we're going to prescribe or not. And one of the issues is to get people who are, um, are powerful people, key opinion leaders, onto papers. And, the, and this is what's called is ghostwriting. The people are not involved at all. They don't write the papers, but they are given, they are gifted the, author, the authorship as very senior members are gifted the authorship to say that here's a very senior person promoting this. And it's a, it's a very difficult um, environment to, to work in because unless the journals are scrupulous about understanding if you truly did or did not commit to that piece of work, how do you, understand, how do you actually decide that if you gifted that? It's very difficult. So if you look at what they do, you get medical writers, okay, not as medical writers, right? So people aren't even writing their own, their own data. It's authored by respectable academics, and there's a few in the audience over here, okay? The profit interest shapes, so basically, depending on how much money you want to make, will shape what is actually put out for us to, for us to, for us to read about. And then you have 
uh, people that um, go out there and write the publication for you. And in some data, there's ghost writing is 75% of the publications are actually being, are in fact, ghost written by respected academics, people from John Hopkins. Okay? And you can go read about it. It's just maybe not in the, in the, in the, in the literature that we read on a regular basis in terms of, of conflict of interest. And that's a real worry because what is the real truth? At the end of the day, we want to prescribe safety to people and medicines that, I'm talking about medicines, medicines that are effective and we're going to get the outcome that, that, that is required. So what do we know about conflicts of interest research? Well, in duplicate publications, they selectively publish, so you get the six months, you don't get the one year, and you get the one year publications three years down the line, so they selectively publish uh, in terms of what they want to convince us to move forward, and obviously selective reporting, because you don't know what the, the truth really is. Did we take tummy flu here? Did we also tummy flu? Tummy flu, did we take it? Does it work? You would know if it works. I can tell you there's, there's uh, 13 studies. Two have been published. There's 11, nobody knows in terms of there's 11 other studies. They're all done. So none of us know if it works. There's some idea that it stops you, it brings you back to work in 13 and a half hours. Okay. So nobody, nobody knows. But if nobody knows what the truth is yet, it was stockpiled, remember? Stockpiled. And most people are using it at this moment in time without understanding actually know the data or not. And then what happens is that the drug company results are often favorable. It's very unusual for a drug company to publish something which is not favorable. It's counterintuitive to publish that. And you can put it in a car magazine, you can, put, you can put what you like in. So what do they do? They use an inappropriate comparator. Okay, that's the best way to do it. So if you're looking at an atypical neuroleptic for patients with schizophrenia, then the drug that you use is always haloperidol or high dose. Because haloperidol will do this to everybody. People get used to study because that's what it does. They're not going to use a drug called chlorpromazine or something else or clozapine. Use haloperidol because the adverse events will come out. Or you use a, a beta block in somebody with left ventricular hypertrophy, it will never work. There's certain drugs that don't work in left ventricular hypertrophy, but that's your comparator in terms of what you're doing. So we're going to be careful that when we read, we are reading critically that we know what should and shouldn't actually happen before we trust okay, the actual data that there is. They often use different dosages, so you can either use a higher dose which will produce adverse effects, or a lower dose, lower at the lower level, which may reduce the effectiveness. So when you read, you've got to be clear that they're actually doing, uh, that they're using the, the data that you know you know well. And then obviously unfavorable studies are not, uh, are not published, or published in journals, which none of us will, 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 will actually find. I thought this was quite interesting. For anyone who relies on published data alone to choose a specific drug, our results uh, should be a cause for concern. Without access to all studies, positive as well as negative, published as well as unpublished, any attempt to recommend a specific drug is likely to be based on biased evidence. If you all read critically and you look at forest plots or if you look at funnel plots, heard of funnel plots? So basically a funnel plot, and what you should do is you should find all the data should fall on both sides of the funnel. Because if it hasn't, well, where is it? Okay? Where's the data? Where's the, you want to get the true effect side, but you left on the one side without any data. So the funnel isn't full. You know, most of us as full funnels, it should fall equally. And that means all the studies, negative and positive, are around, and we can make a decision on what the true effect size is. So if it's not there, you could probably use it for a Brian Saturday. <laughs> what about gifts? Okay, trinkets, travel, hotel meals, and entertainment. Okay. Pharma are major funders of CMD. That's a problem. The Health Professionals Council said to us, we have to have CMD, CPD. So what do we do? The pharmacy industry said, brilliant. Okay. We'll host, it's too expensive, it's a very expensive, getting all of us here today is very expensive, we're missing work, there's a whole issue around that. So we get the pharmaceutical industry to do that, okay? Everybody sits and has a meal, all right, that's CPD, and we all get the certificate. Okay? I can show you data that's sitting in the audience here, okay, listening to me, you, you will learn nothing from me, whatsoever. The best thing is to read, and probably to do your own portfolios of learning and hand it into the Health Professionals Council and show what you've actually done. The CME has created a huge industry for the industry to tell us about things. And they're obviously, and I'll say a few words, they fund professional societies, journals, and supplements. Remember, supplements are on peer review, so again, you should be very wary of looking at supplements. What about a gift that triggers an obligation response as an offer of friendship? Of friendship. I'll give you something, you give me something in return. The, the marketers are doing what they do. It's not a bribe, it's their juice. We believe because we're in healthcare professions, we are <coughs> the right thing, we should be smoothed around, we should get meals, okay? And the flip side of entitlement is indebtedness. Right? Indebtedness means you may prescribe without them. Okay. And what do we know? Prescribing practice changes, decrease prescribing of generic drugs is a disaster. Okay? If you don't use generics, the 
it's, it becomes unaffordable to treat a lot of patients. Okay? And we can talk about generics at another stage. And that's what happens. I can see in my hospital and Victoria and Somerset where reps have gone by and there's suddenly generics. And people are first prescribed by trade lab and they don't want the generics anymore. It's, it's, a, it's, a, major, it's a major issue for us. High <coughs> drug costs, okay? And this thing is, I started, it's erosion of public confidence. So anywhere on Discovery Health, uh, so you go to the pharmacy and you say, my doctor prescribed this, and they say, sorry, you can't have it. What are you talking about? I spent an hour with the doctor, and he said, this is the best stuff, and you're telling me, oops, it's not. Right? And maybe it's a generic, maybe a different name, and you've eroded the public. They don't know who to trust now. Do they just trust Discovery Health, or they trust us as, 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 as clinicians? It's a major problem in terms of adherence and looking after patients. You don't have to answer this. It's a busy day in your, uh, your office, and somebody wants to come and speak to you, a rep, Okay, and they bring you a sample of a new quinolone uh, antibody or bupiquinone, and they know that you play golf. Just remember, all CPD occurs on golf estates. Okay? And they've brought you a, a, a whole lot of golf balls in days in there to you, and they offer you a weekend at the country club. Would any of you take it? You don't have to tell me that now. <laughs> Does the industry influence? Okay, so we know that the financial benefits make uh, doctors more likely to refer patients for tests. Remember that in, in Joburg, they bought a CT scanner, a bunch of neurosurgeons bought a CT scanner, and everybody okay, in the whole hospital had a CT scanner. Yeah? Everyone, I don't know what you came, saw to, CT scanner. <laughs> and the bottom line is the push for stocks in the hospital pharmacies. The pharmacists here, yeah, the Red Cross pharmacists, no. Yeah. Original paper published in, 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 in journal supplements, okay, are sponsored by the industry. Remember I tell you that the supplements are not peer reviewed, so be careful how you review them. And uh, this is very consistent. Reviews that acknowledge sponsorship by the pharmaceutical or tobacco industry will more likely draw conclusions in favor of that, of that industry. And you can read and you can look at the data yourself. Okay. Okay. This is just, there were 160 reviews. 37% uh, concluded that passive smoking was not harmful and the rest of it was. And I just want you to read this in yellow. And uh, the decision, that the conclusion was whether the author was affiliated with the tobacco industry or not. And the same thing happened with calcium channel blockers and they thought to be dangerous. Okay. Depending if you were bought by the company or not, will depend on uh, what your decision was on calcium channel blockers about 10 years ago. This is very dangerous for us, as, well, for you as pediatric prescribers. So this is the analysis of 42 placebo-controlled trials of SSRIs, the wonder medicines, fluoxetine, peroxidine, serotonin. Okay, this is the SSRIs which are meant to be more safe than, uh, than the tricyclic antidepressants. Let me tell you, they're a lot more safe. They're very difficult to use and they have a massive risk of suicide ideation, and they energize you. So there's more, more suicide attempts occur on SSRIs than on, than on tricyclists because they energize you without actually taking care of your depression. When you look at the results of published data, okay, the experimental drug was more effective as SSRI than placebo. We're talking about um, uh, 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 SSRIs. When they looked at a meta-analysis of randomized control studies okay, for depression in children, they looked at articles published and unpublished, not just and unpublished, by the Committee of Safety of Letters, like the MCC or the FDA. This is what they found. They found that, in fact, the, the, the risks outweigh the benefits for four of the five drugs. The only drug which was presumed to be safe was a drug called fluoxetine. The rest were dangerous, were causing suicidation and the risk of suicide, suicidation and the risk of excess suicide in, in, the, in, the, in the pediatric population. And the question was, okay, it was unknown if the unpublished articles were not published due to publication bias against negative studies and they were withheld from the, from the results, okay, or this was a, a strategic mission of the industry not to actually publish. What did they find? It was a $16 billion claim okay, because the company knew the risk of the SSRIs, okay, and then everyone was complicit. The data for approval for SSRIs in children was weak, the evidence was known to be unsafe in children. The data was massaged or manipulated. Unfavorable results were not published. We didn't get the whole, the whole data. And for me, the most important thing is patients were actually gone. Patients were into trouble because of this. So everybody failed. The regulatory system failed. The okay, bias results were not, were, not, uh, were not published. And obviously, people made money from that. What about professional societies? Okay. And you can look to see who funds professional societies. And you can make a decision if it's worthwhile looking at the data that comes out of professional societies. And this is purely about how you screen for colon cancer. So if, you're a, if you look at the data for the radiologist, then they will tell you that barium enema is the best way to screen for colon cancer. If you're a gastroenterologist, then you should be colonoscopy. Don't figure. Okay? 
okay? So guess what, okay? What do you, what do you actually do? What is the true, the true data for that? And what about quality of care with prescription drugs? Okay, you get disease mongering, over-medicalization, okay? And I'll show you a few of that. I'm almost here discussing okay? There's treatment on non-disease or trivial entities. Borders becomes a problem now, so we have to treat it, okay? Uh, people live with it, but not all. They're going to die from it. Premature intervention into less severe conditions because we're pushing out, okay? More and more methods. We must treat, we must treat. And some of us use that prescription as a dismissal form. Am I right? How many of you do that, don't I? Okay? And you're cut for that, you had it up. Okay. 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 increases the side effects of drugs, okay? And the more drugs you add, the more risk of drug interactions and the risk of adverse events, okay? And then there's obviously an unpredictable increase in the risk of errors because we are writing 20. You know, look at a cash firm on discharge, writing 20, 20 things down, you're going to get bored after the first seven, okay? So I'm making mistakes. And then the issue around off-label use, I'm going to finish on off-label use, which means that the drug is not being, it's not the indication that the medicine is actually registered for, and what people, the companies do, they uh, underground, they promote that, because that's another way of actually making revenue. So this is Franklin versus Pfizer, okay, I apologize for that, which was a global settlement, okay, because Pfizer pushed the off-label use of a, of a commonly used drug. And it was basically 430 million that they, that they, a fine that they had to pay at that time because of this. So I just want to read this to you. The medical affairs supervisor, when we get out there, we want to kick some arse on neurontin, which is gabapentin. We want to sell neurontin on pain, or right? Remember, gabapentin is registered for epilepsy, add on to epilepsy, okay? And monotherapy, everything we can talk about, that's what we want to do, okay? Directive self, we want you out there every day selling neurontin. We all know that neurontin is not great for adjunctive therapy, which is an epilepsy. Besides, that's not where the money is. Pain and management, now that's money. Minor therapy, that's money. Neurontin for pain, neurontin for motor therapy, neurontin for bipolar, neurontin for everything. I don't want to see a single patient coming off neurontin before they've been up to at least 4,000, top dose of 4,800 milligrams per day. I don't want to hear that safety crap either. <laughs> so what do they do? They stretch the Park Davis to Pfizer, they didn't seek regulatory approval, okay, for off-label off use, okay, but they market it anyhow, pain, 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 pain. Okay, a big publication strategy, there was obviously some data, Dissemination with key opinion leaders, okay? And they talk about this drum beat that people think you're on to you're on to you're on to I'm just write it up because it's actually a wonder the wonder mice and perhaps everything. Okay? And there are a whole lot of marketing marketing assessments to try and get people to prescribe this. Okay? So they had medical liaisons, advisory board meetings to, to keep up the information around Neurontin, CMEs like this, and general meetings and teleconferences to talk about Neurontin for pain. Okay, they had payments to physicians. $50 million to 3,000 physicians, grant speaker fees, honoraria, paid vacations, Olympic tickets, not unusual, okay, to be flown all over the world. Have any of you flown to Olympic Games? I can't wait to go. <laughs> you know what I'm doing wrong, okay? Most of the articles I've spoken about, and then they suppress the negative information. Uh, niche estimate for lifetime sales in Rotten was $500 million. The sales in Rotten like sees $5 billion annually. Okay, $5 billion annually, okay? Don't worry. Ford did the same thing. Many years ago, Ford put the petrol tank at the back of, it, of their cars. And what happened is they gave a back smack, it just, it just exploded. Okay? Like a cougar, okay? Right. So, and, and, and what Ford did, they said, hold on a second, let's just work out how many, how many people get cranked in the back. Okay? Right. Let's work out how many And how many settlement claims do we have to do compared to actually redoing the whole cars? They decided to take the hit on, on people actually getting cranked and setting the tank. So all industry may, maybe seems to be a problem. Okay? And then this issue of disease mongering, okay? Right? Disease mongering, when you create, you create new diseases, right? And if you create disease, you have to treat it, right? So menopause becomes hormonal deficiency, and we know that there's a major form of HRC, guys. It's a big risk, okay? After observational studies showed benefit, randomized control studies, in fact, it showed harm to so the the population. And maybe it's okay when you're 62 to have a heart attack. So nobody actually thought to take that up and die off, no problem. Okay. Shyness becomes social anxiety disorder. Okay. Acid, reef, uh, acid indigestion becomes bored, so you can treat it. And low thresholds for treating common conditions. Okay. And, and, and uh, if you remember baldness, okay. sexual dysfunction, all of these are now massive, 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 massive okay. You spoke earlier <coughs> about breastfeeding. You said 35 pounds for, for breastfeeding. Am I right? For not breastfeeding, sorry, for, uh, for breast sucks on a big kid. But well, here we are. So I'm spending 50 billion. Okay? So you can't read that, okay? which is basically detailing to doctors, which is 10 billion. 
50 billion dollars he spent on, on, on direct, direct on advertising. Okay? And, and, and I fly to Victoria once a week to the uh, to health to, to all the health. And you can go make a weed at Oil Tumba and you look up and there's an ad for Dettol. And it says Dettol kills 99.9% of all known germs. So I panic. I shut myself. as soon as the lag. There's somebody in this what point one of this that Dettol can't kill. There's a germ that Dettol can't kill. <laughs> They stop sampling in South Africa. And you can see why sampling is, is very important. So if I give you a sample and you start, start on a patient, somebody has to fund that later on. Yeah. And direct to consumer adverts work extremely well. You start getting huge increases in sales of medicines over the counter that you wouldn't have seen. Okay. And then just go on the internet. Okay. Simple ways to improve your, uh, your experience. This is a feature you can put in, uh, you can put in, um, uh, you can put in Viagra, you can put in any of the ones you want to do. Remember about two years ago, Pele, you know Pele, the soccer player, came on and said 80% of men over the age of 40 develop erectile dysfunction. I'm 54. I am panicking. Because <laughs> Pele said so. This is Lipitor, lowers bad cholesterol, 39 to 60% in low mind. And I take Lipitor because it does even more than low mind cholesterol. So I'm wondering what, they, what it does. <laughs> yes, we should all be taking it. And that's from Dr. Robert uh, Jarvik, inventor of the Jarvik Artificial Heart. So he's a real good guy to actually be talking about this. <laughs> this is Prinavil, once in a Prinavil, which is Lysinavil and ACE inhibitor, both on the job every day. And this says, okay, which I had to block and get, I get had to get help on this. Okay, Coral Pingini is not hypertensive, he's not taking Prinavil. Okay, that's very hard. Okay. <laughs> Richard Horton, the editor of Lancet, said Germans have developed into information laundering operations for the industry. Okay, he said that many years ago. This is the issue in terms of journals, okay, they're funded by the drug industry, okay, in terms of the, uh, the, the funding, okay, journals, be careful. Reprints, all that stuff that they give you, I'm going to stop now, all the reprints, 1.5 million. So if you have something published in the New England Journal of Medicine, you can't give it away for free. You've got to buy it back from the New England Journal of Medicine, and that's called a reprint. And that's what you will pay for that to, to give it off. Otherwise, you just get out some, some editors. And to end off, Winston Churchill said, men stumble over the truth from time to time. They must pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing happened. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks William. It was really a, a great talk. And uh, I'm sure uh, we're all doing a bit more introspection as we, as we sit here. Um, I, we don't have a lot of time, but if there's one burning comment or question, I can take it while we load the next slide. And maybe at the same time, if some people want to come and occupy these seats down here, uh, then we can get some, mm -hmm. some of the waiting water tonight inside. Uh, any, any burning questions? Before I... So, as an academic, I just have to clarify that journal supplements in respectable medical journals are here. Yeah, to, but not to the same standard as, as the peer review that we that you have for usual journal. They are. Because of the respectable journal, the MJ, the Lancet, the Peer Review, multiple times. So it depends on the journal. I'm not going to argue with you, but it's interesting to decide what's a respectable journal that you're talking about. That's very important. That's for another discussion. Is it a high impact factor, or do you think because of what? So you should remember the New England Journal of Medicine, they are the ones that, did, that, that, that would not publish the data on Rofecoxib. Let's be careful about respectable. And Rofecoxib was killing patients with acute cerebral and acute vascular events. And what happened is Marcia Angel from the New England Journal of Medicine, she resigned because of that. They refused to publish it. So in terms of respectable journals, I'm a bit nervous about that, about, about that work. But I, I'm just having some fun, I promise you. I understand that. Thanks very much, Mark. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, mm -hmm. Professor David Saunders. Uh, Professor Saunders is uh, an emeritus professor here and professor at UWC, where he founded the School of Public Health. Um, he's a totally international expert on infant nutrition <coughs> and feeding, uh, infant feeding. Uh, he's worked with the WHO, with UNICEF, with national governments. 
and he spent much of his time, I believe, in Zimbabwe before coming to South Africa, and would have worked a lot in Zimbabwe before coming to South Africa. So uh, there's no one better to address this this issue of uh, of infant formula and breast milk uh, breast milk marketing uh, breast milk substitute marketing. Uh, no one better qualified than than David to do that, and it's a great honour to have you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, <coughs> that promotion was about as dishonest as the drug company. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm really, yeah, well, that was not peer review. <laughs> so I'm really worried by what Mark said because I'm now over 70 and. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so I'm here because I am so old and nobody bothers if I get attacked. My younger colleagues were too frightened to give this talk. <laughs> so I'm giving it on their behalf. So I'm naming some people. <laughs> and there are a few others I'm prepared to name private. So I'm talking about breastfeeding and formula feeding. So, <clears throat> the Lancet First Child Survival Series, which is still a classic, did some work on how many child deaths could be prevented. They made the point, which I'm putting up here just to remind us, that The children we look after have usually got more than one problem. And most of them have got a nutritional problem, underweight, as well as whatever they're admitted for. Actually, even if they come into the trauma unit, you'll probably find that a quite big percentage of them will be underweight. So we may only be partially treating the children with the children's problems. So the risk of death increases greatly with increasing undernutrition. So in this paper, they made calculations about how many deaths could be prevented by key interventions. And far and away, the most effective was breastfeeding, which they calculated could result in a reduction of 13% of all young child deaths. So, where are we in South Africa? So, this plots on the y-axis life expectancy at birth against GDP, gross domestic product, per capita in US dollars. With the poorest countries on the left, the lowest life expectancy at the bottom. So you can see that there is a relationship we'd expect, that the richest countries generally have the highest life expectancy. There are some outliers. For example, in Japan, life expectancy is higher than in the US, even though in the US GDP capita is higher. And when I'm 80, I'm going on a long holiday to Japan because women live much longer than men. <laughs> So, if we look at South Africa, you can see that for our level of GDP per capita, we're an extremely poor performer. We are way down. We're on a par, really, with Nigeria. So, there has been an improvement, as indicated inside the South Africa, <coughs> and that is largely attributable to our successful antiretroviral program. And we've had an increase in life expectancy, which the Department of Health quite rightly boasts about quite often. However, we seem to be stuck. So our Millennium Development Goal by the end of 2015 was to reduce our under five mortality rate from what it was estimated to be in 1990, namely 61, down to 
down to one third of that level, namely 20. We reached about 45 in 2015. Introduction of IMCI seemed to make little difference, and of course, it was just before the peaking of the AZ. And introduction of PMTCT was largely responsible for this sharp decline in under five mortality. So where are we now? So these are the latest data, <clears throat> and the various estimates of under five mortality, which is the blue line, put it at somewhere between 37 and 42. So let's say we're at 39. The point is that there seems to be a flattening of We are not succeeding as we were. The rate of decline is little. And as far as neonates are concerned, complete flat line. Very little impact over the years. So newborn deaths form an increasing percentage of all deaths. And you can see this is the latest pie chart of causes of under five deaths. And you see that the top three are HIV, 17%, although that's going down. Pneumonia is 17%. If you also include pneumonia amongst neonates and diarrhea. Those are the top three, except the neonatal tests, which comprise the largest slice of the pie. So there's been little change in the leading causes of death, except for HIV. So there's a lot of info. Here's a pool study published in The Lancet some years ago, which shows the relative risk of infectious disease mortality from never breastfeeding. So you can see in the under two month age group, the relative risk is almost six times as high. It declines somewhat, but even at nine to 11 months, it's 1.4 times higher than if breastfeeding. So there's a lot of supplement on breastfeeding a couple of years ago two articles, which are really well worth reading. Nigel Rollins, who used to work in South Africa, is one of the legal authors. And they calculate that improving breastfeeding would save about 820,000 children under five per year, and 87% of it are infants under six months. And of course, it reduces infection-related mortality very significantly. So how are we doing? Well, our figures before the latest DHS survey, which I'll show next, showed that we had extremely low rates of breastfeeding. The blue is 1990 to 1999, and the purple, 2000 to 2006. So you can see, compared to other African countries, very poor. The latest figures, which heartened some of us, I don't know if you can read this from the back, but the ring on the left shows that at six months, about 24% are being breastfed. What is disturbing, however, is that 27% are not breastfed at all. That age. So we've improved, but we're not doing so now we know, or at least those who write these articles know, I don't fully understand them, we know that breast milk <coughs> confers all sorts of benefits. It has an impact on the gut microbiome in the first year of life. And you can see the differences. It is supposed to represent bacteria in women who have vaginally delivered and are breastfeeding on the left, vaginally born, bottle fed, and cesarean section. And a healthier group of 
microbes in the first case. They compared formula fed and breast fed monkeys and the breast fed on the right show that in various dimensions of immunity they are much better equipped. And there are now lots of connections noted between intestinal microbes and brain and breast milk is a novel source of stem cell differentiation potential. So they ask the article, or they ask in the Lancet article, why would national authorities not invest in protecting, promoting, and supporting breast milk? We know that with interventions, including some Tanya Doty, myself, and others were involved in, you can increase exclusive breastfeeding by more than two times with quite simple interventions involving lay health workers. We do a community-based trial in, uh, in rural and urban settings and we found that in three countries where we did this, we could secure a doubling or more of exclusive breastfeeding. Unfortunately, in South Africa, the level went up from very, very low to very low. So, <clears throat> the breast milk substitute industry is growing. So, the top line shows retail sales from 2010, no, sorry, 2001. The middle shows volume and the bottom line shows GDP growth. <coughs> So even though economic growth has been limited and sometimes negative, retail sales continue to go up globally. And in South Africa, similarly, our retail sales went up very dramatically. And of course, during the period inside of the ring, this was the period when free formula was made available in PMTCT programs and many of us believe that was a wrong policy we still believe that uh, but now we know that with part um, it would definitely be the wrong policy and of course free formula is now withdrawn so because of the crisis there are a number of regulations the South Africans had a voluntary code, so this code of marketing on breast milk substitutes was elaborated in the early 80s, and it has been around in South Africa for a long time, but not much attention has been paid to it. So in 2011, the Trina Declaration resulted in legislation to support breastfeeding and to regulate formula milk. So this regulation, Act Number R991, is relating to foodstuffs for infants and children and comes under the Foodstuffs, Cosmetics and Disinfectants Act. It was gazetted in December 2012 and as said here, it intends to promote the appropriate use of commercial processed foods and to promote optimal nutrition and feeding. So, this act proscribed outlaws these sorts of promotional displays and sales. This is the Gazette. Um, you can read it if you're interested. It came out on the 6th of December 2012. And I've just excerpted a few of the more important sections. For example, the section about material directed at healthcare providers. That they are supposed to be inspected. And if you commit a, an offense, you are liable to 
tent. And so, so I've done this one now. And you can see it says that a person, manufacturer, distributor may provide technical scientific uh, advice, provided that such information is restricted to current scientific and factual matters. It bears no health claims, etc. And these are the penalties, in case anyone knows wants to know exactly how they're going to be punished. So, at the UCT Pediatric Profession Course in 2016, there were clear contraventions. So, NOVALAC, for example, the red one, talks about how regurgitation will be helped by this particular formulation. This prompted a letter from the Child Health Advocacy Group about sponsorship of the UCT Pediatric Refresher Course and the marketing of breast milk substitutes. There's a long preamble, but in red, you can see that despite this, the promotion of breast milk substitutes at the 2016 Refresher Course contravened the provisions of Regulation 991. Pharmaco displayed a number of infant formula milks with claims as to their health benefits in contravention of that section 11.2. Aspen displayed the logo, etc., and we requested the Executive Committee of Public Pediatrics and Child Health to put clear measures in place to prevent further attempts by industry to use our events as a platform to market breast milk substitutes. So we then took photographs at the Pediatric Professional Course in 2017. No change. There again, no belief. I think they've changed their colors. <laughs> I mean, the colors, not their colors. And you can see they say that a particular formulation of Novolac is good for hungry and sleepless babies. And it addresses constipation and slow transit. I presume that means bowel transit. <laughs> Nestle held a breakfast at which someone, uh, a supposedly scientific symposium, where a Nestle representative was the only speaker. So again, a letter was sent. On the 20th of March 2017, by this department, again complaining that, stating we have a special responsibility as a prestigious pediatric department to model good practice and to support breastfeeding. And again, notes that. <coughs> Bottom, we need specific attention to the following questions. Should our department receive any funding from companies who make breast milk substitute, given that this creates a potential conflict of interest? If so, how do we ensure that this financial support complies with the International Code and Regulation 991? How do we raise broader awareness of these? And how do we respond to those companies who contravene Regulation 991? So, these photos were taken just two weeks ago, in 2018. And we've whited out the faces of uh, people there who might not want to be identified. But if anyone recognizes themselves, they should reflect on whether that food was coming free from the <laughs> And you can see, perhaps, that uh, some lettering at the back says, inspired by nature's perfection. That is man. And in the tiny letters above it said, breast milk is best for babies. 
So here we have another lack again, excessive crying, treatment of diarrhea. So, finally, the manufacturer has the right to have a standard of conference, permitted to sponsor into a funding pool, but must abide by the regulation. So, very kindly, um, Vitboy from the department, uh, the provincial department, looked at some of the contravention. I won't read them through, but in the right column you see that the product that was being launched, HMO, claims that it has health benefits and is clearly compared to human milk. The stand was designed for the upcoming launch of this product, HMO, the company produced a flyer. The flyer was branded for health care professionals only and there was no reference, no scientific reference to the claims made, but they said they'd make it available on request. And so on and so forth. There are several contraventions which were noted yet again. So product launches are actually prohibited, despite the, the fact that this HMO product was launched at the refresh board. So Nestle and Mark Blockman suggested that this was a way of engineering conflict of interest, sponsors a lot of pediatric and nutrition congresses. Probably contravenes R991. And there's a lot of evidence that such marketing undermines efforts to promote breastfeeding, and we're in desperate need of doing so. And Mark showed some of the investments by pharmaceutical corporations, but investment in promoting breast milk substitutes exceeds government spending. <coughs> So the last slide is, what is our responsibility? I think it's important that we become familiar with what the code says and that we strive to promote, protect and support breastfeeding in our daily practice, including on pediatric wards and advocate for breastfeeding. Thank you.
uh, recognizing that it's actually a war uh, against these really powerful companies that have, have infinite more, infinitely more resources than everybody else in the world. But the point to, to demonstrate that is look what's happening in the US with the NRA. Companies are dropping sponsorship deals with the NRA like public centers. So we do have power. 